lights flashed out to sea along the Northland shore And south along the sheltered bays where sailors came before In wooden plank and hammered steel with oak and mast and steam The guardians of the lake stand true with piercing cold and beam Flashed out to sea along the Northland shore And south along the sheltered bay where sailors came before The guardians of the lake stand true with piercing golden beam Hi and welcome to the special edition of Great Getaways. We're going to be doing a two-part series on the lighthouses of the Lake Michigan shoreline. I have a special guest with me here today, Dan Hall, and Dan wrote and sang all the songs that are in this, and Dan, we have worked with you for years. Uh, you always do such great stuff, and you really like lighthouses. I happen to love lighthouses. I've been to lots of them, and uh, look forward to going to even more. Now, what else do you do besides this? Well, yeah. I've, I've written a lot of songs with kids in elementary schools, and some of the topics turned out to be lighthouses. In fact, we used a couple for the show. Okay, that's great. I'll tell you what, this is going to be a really great show. Let's get it started. There are thousands of shipwrecks documented on the Great Lakes, but it's the countless number of lives saved by the tirelessly working keepers of the light that we honor with our visit to some of Michigan's mysterious lighthouses. Whether it was the shoals, the rolling fog, or fiercest of storms that put the seamen and their ships in danger, it was the lighthouse keeper's responsibility to sound the warning and keep the beacons beaming through it all. Come along as the guiding lights lead us into the past. The earliest explorers who plied these waters relied on experience and instinct to save themselves from the lake's fury. But as settlements developed and commerce grew, larger ships and the crews to run them were needed to meet the demand. And with modern sailing practices, crews could no longer rely on just slipping ashore to wait out a storm or keep land within sight for navigation. They needed a way to guide them from harm's way. And that guidance was found with the lighthouse. Adopted in use from Europe and later colonial America, the lighthouses became the savior of many a ship. They were the Guardians. We start our lighthouse adventure on the rugged northern Lake Michigan shore at the Sichua Point Lighthouse. The lighthouse was named by French sailors who found that the protected bay formed by the point was their only choice for shelter along that stretch of northern Lake Michigan shoreline. Father William Gagnier, a Jesuit missionary among the Native Americans, claimed that locals called the point Sichua. Regardless of the name's origin, today its preferred pronunciation is Sichua. Set their fires along the shore while making passage through. Later, other boats would come and bring their fishing fleet to anchor in calm harbor there, three fathoms safe and deep. Upon the waves of Sailors bravely go has a resident spirit. 
that is believed to be Captain Joseph Willie Townsend, who served as keeper between 1901 and 1910. A number of persons, as early as 1960, have reported strange happenings around the keeper's dwelling, from moving silverware and a self-closing Bible, to footsteps on the stairs, and the strong smell of cigar smoke. Sichua is a magnet for lighthouse enthusiasts and historians. The Gulliver Historical Society is the current keeper and restorer of the light station. Most of the original buildings remain on the site and are open to visit, and the tower is open to climbing. This is a relatively rare opportunity at an active aid to navigation. In the early 20th century, Manistique was a boom town with lumber and pig iron being shipped out of the harbor daily. What well, was decided in 1913 that these piers and the lighthouse had to be built. They were finished in 1915. George Putnam, the newly appointed commissioner of lighthouses, recommended the erection of lights on the breakwater. Construction was completed in August and the new light was lit on August 17, 1916. As the century progressed, Manistique's importance as a port waned. The light was automated in 1969 and the original fourth order Fresnel lens was replaced with a 12-inch Tideland signal acrylic optic. In 2000, the Corps of Engineers replaced the concrete breakwater with riprap. There is a tale of a sunken ghost ship and a ghostly ship's captain said to wander through Manistique and of unsolved mysteries puzzling locals for many years. No one knows for sure how many wanderers there were along the Manistique River. Saloon goers in the riverfront areas for years have repeated rumors that an old captain wanders from the river and haunts early morning Manistique streets, bumming cigarettes and hoping to find a few drops of liquor in a discarded bottle. Often, just after he is seen, the observer who has rejected his advances thinks better of it, turns to help and finds the street empty. The scruffy, begging captain vanished. Peninsula Point Lighthouse sets along the deserted point of the Stonington Peninsula. Although the keeper's house is long gone, the tower still stands as a reminder of the past time, standing tall and ghostly as if guarding the men and ships of another era. Moving further into the western upper peninsula of Michigan, approaching the point of Stonington Peninsula that stretches south between Little and Big Bay Dinoc, the 40-foot tower of the Peninsula Point Lighthouse stands as a reminder of the days when industry brought boat traffic to the ports of Escanaba, Gladstone, Fayette, and Nama along the north shore of Lake Michigan. The walls of the Peninsula Point Lighthouse have little to say as the keeper's quarters burned in 1959. All that remains of the attached church tile, one and a half story yellow brick keeper's dwelling are signs of the dwelling's foundation along the north side of the tower. There were six head keepers of the light. The last keeper of record was Captain James Armstrong, who was head keeper from 1889 to 1922. When he arrived on the peninsula, there were no roads, so any travel from the station by land had to be made on horseback. A few years later, crude roads were established and Armstrong's wife and six children grew to like the area. A visitor to the area today can see why when they climb the tower for marvelous views of the surrounding waters. Today, the lighthouse has a totally unrelated purpose and while its history is fascinating, the peninsula naturally collects monarch butterflies at its tip each September when they gather to feed at the point before winging their way across Green Bay to the Door Peninsula and their remarkable flight south for the winter. Visitors can migrate on County Road 513, 19 miles to Stonington Point, to see the lighthouse. The last mile requires driving through a tightly winding virtual tunnel through pine trees. The lighthouse has been incorporated as part of the Hiawatha National Forest and the park continues to maintain the tower and the grounds as a public picnic area. 
For many years, sailors have dreaded the 80 miles of dark shoreline that stretch east from the Grand Island Lighthouse to the light at Whitefish Point. Unmarked by any navigational light, these dangerous shores claim dozens of ships. In 1874, a light was finally built on the Osaba Point. Even the light didn't always protect these ships from the incredible power of Lake Superior. Secluded in nature, it nonetheless is well worth the effort to visit. Starting at the Hurricane River Campground, we hiked the one and one half mile service trail to the lighthouse and other buildings. We came upon something most extraordinary. Protruding from beneath the wet sand and gravel were the remains of several shipwrecks of an age long ago. Their wooden hulls lie partially submerged in only inches of cold Lake Superior water, a final resting place. We imagine that these once proud ships stood tall with their masts pointing defiantly against an angry Lake Superior sky, and rightly so, as these ships were the finest of their day. But now, lying broken in the sand, we couldn't help but think that the timbers that made up their hulls and masts were once possibly pine, spruce, and oak from these very shores. Even the spikes and straps that still hold together what remains could have been mined from the iron ranges only miles to the west. We continued down the beach, leaving these wooden skeletons at the mercy of the relentless pounding surf. An 87-foot brick tower was built on a rise, placing the light about 150 feet above Lake Superior's surface. The third-order Fresnel lens displayed a fixed white light. The attached two-story brick keeper's dwelling was large, but those who lived in it knew theirs was one of the most remote mainland light stations in America. Here, standing at the edge of Lake Superior, the light keeps its lonesome vigil for passing ships. There has been a life-saving station here on Crisp Point since 1875, but with so many ships sinking in this area, it became apparent there was a need for a lighthouse. In 1904, the Crisp Point Lighthouse was brought into service. Along with the lighthouses, life-saving stations served as guardians of the lakes. The Crisp Point Lighthouse was named for the first keeper, Christopher Crisp, who had the reputation as an iron-willed boatman. Perhaps the best description of the location was given by an 1892 visitor as a wild-looking place with tall, somber fir and pine trees in gloomy ranks rearing their plumed heads beside the silent lake for miles. He continued, saying it had a lonesome look on the edge of the endless forest. Visitors today would have to agree. Several years ago, when there were just logging roads that would get you close to the lighthouse, Few visitors, mainly agate hunters, would venture to the shore to get a glimpse of her. Nature had definitely reclaimed the site. After roaring superior storms, the life-saving station was moved three times. The last time, it was placed even with the lighthouse. The station is gone, and the lighthouse itself was nearly in the water before it was leased to the Crisp Point Lighthouse Historical Society who, along with other cooperating organizations, are making amazing renovation to save and preserve the light and its history. Although the fury of the Great Lake storms usually didn't imperil the lightkeeper at his duties, the sheer weight of boredom could often be as dangerous a foe. Author and former lighthouse keeper Don Nelson tells just how lonely it could be. A lot of um, opinions or what people have read uh, uh, regarding the lighthouse keepers uh, as being somewhat of a glorious or glamour uh, life. Uh, in most cases, it was completely the opposite. Um, uh, the keepers that went out, especially to your in the early days, to your remote island stations or isolated shore stations, uh, they were there strictly uh, to keep the light going. The reason uh, that they were so strict on keeping the stations clean, neat, painted, uh, even though it was stuck out in the middle of the lake somewhere, was mainly to keep the guys busy. 
uh, uh, your island stations, your remote stations, uh, uh, families weren't on them. So that there would be three, maybe four that would uh, be out there. One of them generally was uh, on shore leave for uh, anywhere from six to seven days. So life in reality out there was extremely boring, and uh, which led to uh, uh, a lot of uh, fellows uh, going ashore and not coming back. I have stood upon the forecastle at the breaking of the morn when you moved across the water as each new bright day was born i have stood in fear and terror in the fury of the gale bring down peace upon the water may your love and grace prevail i wish to feel your arms around me every hour For Fitzgerald's grave. Well, you know what? I hope you're enjoying the show so far. We've got more good lighthouses coming up. We're going to be going to Copper Harbor. We're also going to be going to the Ludington Lighthouse. An interesting story there. Denny and I stayed overnight there one time. And while we were there, a storm came in that night and knock the light out. I'll tell you what, that's, that's almost crazy. It's just like it had to happen. Yeah, a little too much uh, karma. <laughs> yeah, a little too much, but it was a great time, so let's get going again. At the northern edge of the Keweenaw Peninsula is Eagle Harbor. It is dangerous for navigation, as storms along this part of the coast are especially violent. Waves crash into the rocks on this rarely calm waters and are particularly violent during the storms as they roll across the open waters from Canada. Because of the shipping activity in the Keweenaw vicinity, many lighthouses were necessary for the safety of the ships. The Eagle Harbor Light seen here was built in 1851 and keeps its vigil over Lake Superior and is still active today. This spot was called the Grand Point All Sable before the first light was lit in 1867. The 112 foot tower is a yellow cream brick. Sailors complained though that this cream color blended in with the sand and they couldn't see it. So they repainted the tower in the black and white swirl that you see today. It's called a day mark. Following the Civil War, the Lighthouse Board noted in 1865 that the point was the most important point on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan between Point Betsy and Muskegon, and wrote that the interests of commerce demand that it be suitably lighted. Alonzo Hyde, the first head keeper, lit the tower's lamp for the first time on November 1, 1867, sending forth a fixed white light that could be seen for up to 19 miles. In 1968, the tradition of light keeping begun in 1867 ended when Homer Meverden, the station's last civilian keeper, left. Coast Guard personnel looked after the station until April 1971 when the automated station is left unattended. The third order lens from Big Sable was on display at the Maritime Museum at historic White Pine Village for several years and then after a restoration in 2016 it was placed on display at the Port of Ludington Maritime Museum. During the summer months Volunteer keepers live in the second story of the keeper's dwelling and provide tours to visitors and help with general maintenance. I come every year because it's a fun working vacation. We work while we're here, but we play when we're on our off hours. Uh, when we come in, we have the gift shop that we run. We have the video room where we teach the kids or people that come out here the education of the light, or the history of the light. Uh, we. Also have to have somebody up at the top of the tower here because it's required by law, but we also have to make sure that people keep their feet on the black platform and not try to climb up or do things, do stupid things as we refer to it as. And unfortunately we have had people who have done that. We usually have somebody that has trudged all the way out here, the two, or 1.8 miles I guess it is from the campground. And they're like, we are leaving today. Can we, so we usually get them into the gift shop quickly as possible so they can get what they need there. And then we let them come up in the tower because then we can check out 
while they're doing their tour through the tower up here. And people are pretty good about it. The Ludington North Breakwater Light is not officially a lighthouse since no house has been attached. Edwin Slyfield, lightkeeper in 1891, encountered dangerous conditions when he had to navigate the pier during November gales in order to service the light. The light not only served the vessels plying the waters of Lake Michigan, but it's a great guide to the car ferries coming into Ludington. In 1924, the present tower began to take shape, fabricated of steel plates over a steel skeleton. This four-sided white pyramidal tower was built with four porthole windows on each of the three decks. The unusual shape was designed to deflect the strong waves of Lake Michigan. Little Sable Lighthouse was built on a point which protrudes farther west than Point Betsy and Big Sable Point into Lake Michigan. James Davenport, transferred from his position of assistant keeper at Wagashant's Lighthouse, was the first head keeper at Little Sable Point Lighthouse. He activated the light atop the tower upon the opening of navigation in 1874. He recorded the first of several shipwrecks in the station's logbook on August 6, 1875, when the schooner Blackhawk ran aground on the point. Keeper Davenport noted, crew all saved. Records of shipwrecks near the station were numerous in the late 1880s when Western Michigan provided much of the lumber for Chicago and other growing ports on the Great Lakes. The lighthouse was built in 1874 and it's built by with bricks. Uh, it was originally a red brick, then it was, uh, the mariners were having trouble seeing the lighthouse from. Uh, because of the background and so they painted it white and then uh, in 77 I think it was they uh, because of the cost of maintenance they sandblasted all the white off and that was important because each each lighthouse has its own signatures called signatures a day signature and a light and a night signature and the day signature is the color variations uh, now, the, our day signature is the red brick and there's placement of windows and the black rings around the top with the, the metal as well as the stonework that's up there. So each lighthouse is unique as to its day and night signature so that mariners can see that and know exactly where they are. We made it to the top of the tower and our feet are 92 feet above the ground right now. We're actually staring at a Fresnel lens, a third order Fresnel lens. Third order Larry? Fresnel lens, yeah. And this is the original lens for it. It is, it is. And it's one of the few that are still in the lighthouse. Most of them end up uh, in, in museums now. Uh, and so it's, it's very unusual that we actually have one and it's still operational. The White River Station Lighthouse has the distinction of having the last female keeper in Michigan, Frances Marshall. The station was decommissioned in 1960 and opened as a museum in 1970. The White River Light was built in 1875 by Captain William Robinson. When completed, the lighthouse consisted of a tower set in the northwest corner of a gabled roof, one and a half story dwelling. Limestone was used for the foundation and yellow brick for the superstructure. Uh, one of the lumbering schooners, uh, it left here uh, to go to Milwaukee with a load of lumber. It ran aground not too far from shore off of Milwaukee. They were able to get the entire crew off, but because of the storm that was going on, it just beat the ship to pieces, literally. And across the back was the name, across the stern was the name of the ship came off the stern and when the ship actually sank. About a year or so later, it showed up here floating. And so it had come home, basically. Now, Montague has the world's largest weather vane. And at the top of the weather vane is the ship, the Yellow Ellenwood. White River Lighthouse was deactivated in 1960 and turned over to the General Services Administration. Man.
back in those days at the dock, she served us long and true. She pulls against her lines on land whenever gales blow through. She liked to break the ice and be the mighty Mac once more. But she'll carry on her legacy from her tether on the shore. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first part in our two-part series on lighthouses of Michigan shoreline. Tell you what, next week, remember to watch for the second one. That's going to be coming up if you'd like to get a video to go along with it, which has all the lighthouses along with the music in it. Uh, you can go to the information on the screen. And Dan, uh, you also have just the CD itself. And you could be the lucky, no, I'm just kidding, the lucky owner of these uh, beautiful CDs. There's 15 tracks on here. And uh, all of the music that we used in the show, plus some additional bonus tracks. Hey, like I said, I hope you enjoyed this. Information is on your screen or go to our website and you can get everything else that you need. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Funnel lights flashed out to sea along the Northland shore And south along the sheltered bay where sailors came before In wooden plank and hammered steel with oak and mast and steam The guardians of the lake stand true with piercing golden beams The guardians of the lake stand true with